As you move into and begin to study the spiritual life, you'll discover there are different ways to describe it. And one of the most common titles is the mystical life. And that phrase can conjure up all kinds of different images. There was a particular grad school professor of mine whom I really enjoyed, and I learned a ton from him. Now that said, he wasn't the biggest fan of what he called mysticism. He thought it was a little dangerous and misunderstood and that people can get confused by it. One day he said that the problems of mysticism are seen in the word itself. It begins in the mist, it centers around the eye, and it ends in schism. Now he was obviously being facetious to a degree, but he touched on something real. There's a lot of misinformation about the mystical life floating around out there. There are a lot of people teaching things that are supposedly Catholic, but which are really at odds with what the ancient tradition of the church is. And we'll get to those in later lessons. But for now, I want to begin to define exactly what we mean when we talk about the mystical life. This is really important because it's exactly what we're entering into. That's what these sessions are really all about. Now, perhaps not all of us are called to be mystics, per se, but all of us are called to the mystical life. If you were to give a very short definition of the mystical life, it would be that the mystical life is the hidden life. It's the interior process of becoming more and more like Christ, of being transformed by him. It's our evolution into perfection. It's a process of formation and growth through which we become what we were made to be from the very beginning, the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. I'll unpack this more in a later session, but realize that while Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God back in the beginning, there's a sense in which we are not. We're made in the image of God, but humanity lost its likeness to him when sin entered the picture. The whole Catholic life is all about trying to get that likeness to God back. That's the underlying goal of the mystical life. And notice that a moment ago, I said this is a process of formation and growth. Different saints have described this movement in different ways. St. Thomas Aquinas refers to it as spiritual stages of growth, similar to how we grow up in the natural life. An important 20th century Spanish theologian, Father John Aaron Taro, describes it as a mystical evolution. St. Teresa of Avila says it's like moving through rooms of an interior castle. And we're going to get to all of that. But the point for now is that this is a lifelong organic process. Yes, there are some people to whom God grants an incredibly special grace, and once converted, they immediately rocket to the heights of the spiritual life. They get visions and amazing infused knowledge from the Lord. And they didn't do anything to deserve it, so to speak. God just gifts them with a Ferrari and puts them in the spiritual fast lane. These are the people we would traditionally call mystics or contemplatives. St. John of the Cross is a good example of one of these people. I mean, he was obviously endowed with special graces to ascend to incredible heights of the spiritual life. Now, technically speaking, when we say mystical, we're talking about our inner experience of God. And by contemplative, we're traditionally talking about the highest form of prayer, which is given by God. Mystics seem to be in an almost perpetual state of contemplation, or the highest form of prayer. And we'll get into all that too. In fact, we'll discuss some of the great figures of the spiritual life individually and the particular teachings and advice they bring to the table so we can learn from them so we can move more deeply into God. Now, just because God graces a few select people with rocket fuel graces to quickly ascend the spiritual ladder while on earth, that doesn't mean that the rest of us are supposed to stay on the ground. Every single one of us is called to the mystical life. Now, that said, most of us take the more traditional route through what we call asceticism. Now, the phrase ascetical life may conjure up images in your head of some guy in a bear skin living in a cave eating wild berries. But in reality, it's just the name of the ordinary path, the stages of Christian perfection. And I'm talking about the basics of the science of sainthood, like learning how to meditate well, how to grow in virtue and root out the vice that strangles our spiritual life. It's all the things that we do in the purgative and even some of the illuminative and unitive ways the three main stages of the interior life. 
And if you're wondering what the purgative, illuminative, and unitive stages are, don't worry. I mentioned them before, but we're going to dig way into them because they're the backbone of everything in the spiritual life. Now, as we said before, mysticism is like the other end of the ladder. It's the top end. Mysticism is a kind of experimental knowledge of those who have reached the higher stages of the spiritual life. It's the prelude to glory or foretaste of future happiness, says St. Thomas Aquinas. It's where the soul seems to actually taste, touch, and feel the things of faith instead of just seeing them from afar. Now, while we're going to talk about mysticism, I'm going to tell you right now that while I'm trying, I'm not a mystic. In fact, my bet is that you aren't either. There aren't a whole lot of hanging around, which is probably why there's so many problems in the world today. Not enough of us are progressing in the spiritual life. And there's a sense in which you can't fully describe the mystical state unless you've really had some experience with it. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have some knowledge of it. I've never been to the moon, but I know something of what it's like. And I've been reading and studying many of the great mystics for a number of years. Now, even so, a lot of the language used by them really, it's just not as clear as we'd like. In fact, sometimes it's as clear as mud. They use terms and phrases like the dark knowledge of God or the fragrance of God to describe what it is they're experiencing. Now, we can't blame them for not being crystal clear. They're trying to use natural language to describe the supernatural indwelling of God in their very being. It's like trying to describe astrophysics to a toddler. They're tasting eternity. They're teetering, as it were, on the last rung of the mystical ladder. And it's really hard to describe what it's like to those of us who are on the lower rungs. And yet, they keep trying because they're desperate for us to get to where they are. You know when you're climbing up a mountain or some other height and you get there in front of the other people you're with and you cannot believe the incredible view? Do you just stand there and take it in? No. You're always shouting to the people still climbing, come on, you, know, you got to see this. It's amazing. Well, it's the same with the spiritual giants of our faith. They're trying their best to communicate what they're experiencing. They want us all to taste and see what they do. They are overwhelmed by the light and love of God. They're beginning to palpably experience the deep relationship, the waterfall of the love of God cascading into their soul, the intimate union with him for which we were made. That's what this is all about. That's what we're after. But realize it doesn't just happen all by itself. It takes some effort. And that, again, is why a lot of people aren't progressing. Because of original sin, we all want the easy route. We want the gifts of God to be given to us freely. Well, I got news for you. Salvation may be free, but it ain't cheap. It's going to cost us some things that we are loath to give up. What we have to always keep in mind, though, is the reward. We have to remember the amazing gifts that are available to those who will make the firm decision to point the bow of their spiritual boat in the right direction and plow through some rough seas. Navigating the spiritual life is difficult. We struggle with temptation and sin. We sometimes get off course or encounter heavy swells and stormy weather. Now, even so, we need to set our rudder toward heaven and through the grace of God hold that course to the best of our ability. And that's the final point I'll make in this session. In these opening lessons, I'm describing some very lofty things. And to some of you, they may seem out of reach. You're thinking, there's no way I'm going to get there, Matt. I'm no mystic. I'm no saint. No one's ever going to see my face on one of those holy cards. And I can totally empathize with that sentiment. I often feel the same way. But I want to remind you of a couple of things as we begin this journey together. First, it's exactly that. A journey, one that lasts a lifetime. When you pack up and go on vacation, you know full well it's going to take some time to get there. You also know that getting there isn't always easy. In fact, lots of times the trip is painful. But you go because you know the reward of your labor. And the reward for making this trip through life toward God is way better than a few days at the beach somewhere. It's an ecstasy that defies description. Secondly, we've got help. The point of the science of sainthood is to provide step-by-step -step navigation to give you a GPS to God. 
We've got 2,000 years of spiritual direction from our brothers and sisters who have already made this journey. Jesus blazed the trail. They've charted the course and given us the map. That's what I'm going to lay out in the most understandable and practical way possible. And don't forget that you're not alone in this. You are a member of the mystical body of Christ. There are other people in this Science of Sainthood community that are going through the same spiritual pilgrimage as you. So don't hesitate to reach out and engage them. Don't hesitate to join them in discussion. We are literally the family of God. And as members of the family, we have a responsibility to help one another in our journey, to help each other climb to heights of holiness through the power of Jesus Christ. You can do this. You were made to do this. So let's do it together. God bless you.